Okay, so what's the most important things when we're trying to develop a solid bench press? What are some of the most important factors that we need to have in check? You're not allowed to answer because you've been around me too much. Try to. Maybe. The back. Uh, butt on the bench. But yeah, form. I can see a strong guy for shoulders. Shoulders can play a crucial role. Proper weight. Proper weight. Body weight or weight on the bar? Okay, so we got technical proficiency in knowing what to pick. We said muscles, different muscles. We said proper weight on the bar. We said technique. What's the one thing that directs all training if it's done correctly? What do you say? We need to know your weaknesses. So we all said muscles, and we might be right. We might be way wrong, though. Shoulders yeah. could be absolutely the most horrific thing you could do if your bench press is all shoulders right now. So the thing that drives our understanding of what we should be training is weakness. Now, the problem with saying that in a statement is the fact that weaknesses can be different for everyone. Now, in a team setting, we don't normally get that luxury of a one-on-one -on -one type, this is all of your weaknesses, this is all of the ways we're going to train, right? We have a problem with that. The problem is, is that all of our weaknesses can be different. So what are some key things that's going to change our weaknesses? We have to know these things or we make terrible training decisions. Just speak up. No wrong answers. Yeah. The more you're involved, the more you'll learn. Yeah. One big one is biomechanics. How are we built? Anthropometrics, right? Our length of our shoulder to our elbow, right? Humerus bone. If our humerus bone is really long, hey, good luck having a big bench. Okay, it's going to take a long time. If your shoulders are really narrow, it's going to dictate where you put your hands on the bar. If you're super thick or not very thick, it's going to change how long the stroke is on the bench, right? Shorter distance theoretically equals more weight. Right? If I'm going to get somewhere faster, it's a shorter, shorter way to get there. It's going to be a faster way to get there. Same thing holds true with the bench, right? So the easiest way to make your bench stronger is to gain weight. But the problem with that is it always doesn't match your health or your athletic goals. So sometimes there's a trade-off. If we're just trying to be a bench press specialist, be a big sloppy fat ass and you'll hit bigger weights. <laughs> but you're probably fine when you hit about 34 to 36. The doctor's going to come in and go, and what country are you living in and why is your blood pressure 200 over 180 and why are your triglycerides a thousand right which we've seen that before okay so we got biomechanics what's some other thing what's some other things that could change how we train injuries yeah that's a big one so we got injuries right so injury rates so now if we have injuries so say we've had a pec tear pretty common We've had a rotator cuff problem. We might have to modify the exercises we select in the ways we're going to get stronger. It doesn't mean we don't do the full bench press anymore, but it might mean we need to put board presses in more often because we can't take full range of motion exercises all the time. We might floor presses may not agitate our training. Then again, it may completely cause us to have humongous, horrible um, elbow tendonitis. All of these exercises are different. And some of them that work for me are not going to work for you and vice versa. So over the course of many, many years, you're going to start finding that there are 20, 30, 40 exercises that you can rotate that make you stronger without causing a lot of irritation at the joints, right? Why are those different? Biomechanics. What's another thing that we have to think about when we want to be stronger in the bench press? Rest. Rest is a good one. Um, Variety, yeah, that's a good one. What you eat. What you eat's a good one. What about that one, though? Some of us can be more fast twitch. Some of us can be more slow twitch. Some of us get super amounts of hypertrophy. Others don't, right? Pro bodybuilders look amazing. Some of them have 22, 23 plus inch arms. Why aren't they the strongest benchers in the world? They got the most muscle because it's sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So when you train, you have different types of hypertrophy as well. You have hypertrophy based on sarcoplasm, which is the cell membrane, and then you have hypertrophy based on actin myosin proteins, which is the actual fingers that grab and pull and release, right? So when those break off, they grow back thicker and 
stouter, and then now when they grab and pull the muscle, so if I want a bicep curl, I've got these little tiny fingers that come and grab and pull, grab and pull, right? Actus and myosin hypertrophy. Those actually, the, the actual protein of the muscle is changing. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is the cell around it, almost the fluid, like a bodybuilding pump, correct? And some of that, had, there's a lot more science behind it, but if you think of it in two different ways, you've got actus and myosin hypertrophy and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. For strength, they're both super important, but actus and myosin hypertrophy is the most important. It's the engine, okay? The sarcoplasm is the gas tank, per se. To be, be able to hold more lactic acid tolerance, give you more, that's why bodybuilders like to stay in eights and 12s and 15 rep ranges. It's more, it's more lactic acid tolerance. And if you break it down into time intervals, you're talking anywhere from 30 to 45 seconds up towards of a minute sets. We use those, right? You guys have seen me do stuff for sets of a minute. We've done set stuff for sets of a minute. We're attacking sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So the point is, is that you have all these different kind of hypertrophy ranges and rep ranges that change that are gonna make your training either better or worse depending on what your needs are at that time. Make sense what I'm saying? Okay, so this is gonna dictate weaknesses. Now the other big thing that's gonna start dictating weaknesses lifestyle. I actually just got off a podcast with Matt, and we're talking about what made me a great lifter. A great made me a great lifter was I stayed away from all stressors. It's really hard to do. So when I was at my best, I suffered financially because I would only work four hours a day. I didn't care how much money I had. It did not bother me at all. What bothered me was I didn't win. So I could only handle people for about four hours a day. I knew that was my limit, and that's what I kept to my limit. And that made me make 50, 60 grand a year. First year I retire from powerlifting, I make 400 grand a year. Because now I force myself to deal with things I don't necessarily want to deal with. Therefore, my leg training suffers. My max effort bench suffers. Not doesn't look as much on the Instagram. I've learned to control it. But the first two years I retired, I was putting a lot of extra external stress on me. But what I started to realize was if I didn't pick the right lifestyle to be stronger, right? If you want to be your best, you can still be good. But if you want to be your best, then this is huge. And you talk to anybody like O'Hearn, Stan Efforting, all these guys. These guys got good by isolating themselves and only putting one thing as an importance, right? Stan did it the reverse way. He got wealthy and very smart. And then he was able to focus on bodybuilding. And it wasn't too late or too old to be able to do that. Michael Hearn has always been able to maintain this lifestyle. So when you look at that, you're seeing guys like O'Hearn, you're watching what they tell you to eat and they're watching small clips of their training. But what you don't realize is that their whole life is based around that, which is good if they want to be that good. That's why O'Hearn looks better at 52 than he did when he was 30. It's just a matter of what's worth it to you. So all of us are gonna have different problems here. Everybody has a different piece of the pie that's gonna make them better. So lifestyle also falls into diet which is what all powerlifters don't want to do here. And I'm going to let Stan talk to you a little bit about diet. He's going to be back at some point before the seminar is over. I'm going to let him talk to you just a little bit. He, in my opinion, is one of the few men that have stepped into both sides of the platform, i.e. IFBB pro bodybuilder and a damn good one at that, and then stopped that and became a pro powerlifter and broke multiple world records and looked like a badass doing it. That is really impressive. So I want to let him kind of talk about that because I really have only been able to play around with diet, in my opinion, and get good at it since I've retired. He was able to kind of do both at the same time. Uh, Matt Vincent and um, former uh, Highland Games world champion powerlifter competed with Matt a number of years ago back in the geared stuff. And but getting a chance to listen to someone with that much experience, there's so much to it. And it's little stuff you start to pick up on, like what he's talking about with the warm up and staying in the right heart rate that makes a big difference in what the adaptation is going to be. So there's some stuff like that that I'm picking up. There's stuff with how long a training session should be, and I'm really starting to apply that to other stuff I'm doing as the rules are still great. There's only so many dudes that have that much experience. And getting a chance, even though I've lifted and competed at a high level for a long time, like learning something new is so rad.